Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. My name is Doug Bolton, your proud president of this club, and uh, we thank you for being here, both Rotarians, visitors, guests. Last week, we heard from an incoming community leader about his vision for our city and his organization today. We hear from an outgoing community leader about a big vision for our region as well as country. But as we do every week, let's start our meeting off with the national anthem led by Janet Metzelar on the keyboard and Tony Autry leading us in the singing. Thank you, President Doug. Take it away. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we have at the twilight's last gleaming whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red flare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled sound great. Thank you. All right, Hux Miller, please come forward to lead us in our invocation and four-way test. And as we begin to reflect in our prayer, please keep in your prayers um, John and Katie McCann, our members, uh, on the loss of John's father on February 5th, and then the loss of our great member Ken Saunders on February 1. So please keep his wife, in Rotarian Barbara in your prayers. Hux. Thank you, President Doug. Let us bow our heads. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present today at this meeting of the Cincinnati Rotary Club. Make the hearts and minds of your servants ready to go out into the world and do good, both as volunteers and in our businesses. Open our eyes to the wonders of your creation and help us discern how we might protect it. We thank you for our wonderful city and for those working to improve it through innovation. Amen. And now let us repeat the four-way test of the things we as Rotarians think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, Hux. You may be seated except for Jim Crowley and Trevor Cobain. Jim and Trevor remain standing so that we can wish you a happy birthday on three, one, two, three. Happy birthday, Rotarians. All right, Eric Hill, let's meet our visiting Rotarians and guests. Good afternoon, all. Guests, when I call your name, please stand up so we can welcome you to the, today's meeting. Susan Berman, guest of Anthony Ricciardi. <laughs> Matt Bice with Heritage Bank, guest of Michael Schatzman. <laughs> May Frost with Accenture, guest of Hux Miller. Stacy Hanna with Shill Landscaping, guest of Lisa Lickert. Robert Nischwitz with Jobs 24-7, guest of Camille Scherzinger.
Nick Schroth with Western Governor University, guest of K.L. Allen. Peter Zuthin, guest of Doug Bolden. And Anthony Seppi with Alloy, guest of Dan Spatel. Again, welcome, welcome uh, all of those visitors and guests. The sponsor of today's meeting is our own Environmental Sustainability Committee led by Ariel Miller. Ariel? Thank you, President Doug. How many people are sad and worried by the atmospheric rivers in California, worried about whether you can get homeowner's insurance for your home in Florida, worried about what kinds of horrible dilemmas are going to happen for people around the world who are forced to migrate because of loss of arable land? Well, I'm worried too. And a few years ago, I went to my first Rotary convention in Atlanta, taking two Rotary exchange students. And there I discovered that Rotary had a group of people that was just starting up to work on solutions to this question. And I was overjoyed because I didn't feel lonely anymore. And this group is called the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. It's one of several specialized teams in Rotary that help people implement humanitarian solutions. And it has grown really, really rapidly. It now has 1,500 members all over the world on six different continents. And what we do in ESRAG is inform people about what they can do to solve problems. We bring hope. I'm the editor of the newsletter, and so I get to spend my weeks interviewing people all over the world who are using their knowledge as engineers, as educators, as um, even musicians to solve environmental problems, as farmers, as agronomists. And this just gives me hope and joy and solidarity. So I'm wanting to share some of that with you. The reason why we're sponsoring today's meeting is because Pete Blackshaw stood up at the press conference announcing the latest Cincinnati Green Plan and spoke about the um, opportunities for investors to really do good for themselves and the world by investing in sustainability. And I thought, wow, everybody's skills are needed. And all solutions are local, which is the strength and the power of Rotary, that we are a network of people who are boots on the ground all over the world. And that's where the problem has been created by patterns accumulating over 200 years, and that is where the problem will be solved. We have an amazing city that is way ahead of the curve. Uh, Mark Twain is wrong. We're like decades ahead of most of the rest of the country. And so we're going to have a series of field trips to discover some of the hidden treasures of sustainability in Cincinnati. So before you leave, I want you to pick up the flyers for the field trips. It's called the Green Rotary Road Show that members like Anthony Ricciardi and Rick Flynn and Rick Findlay have put together for us and Jody DeVoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Not only is Mark Twain wrong, there's actually disputes about whether he even actually ever said that. So um, <laughs> let's meet uh, our new member, Greg Winkfield. Greg, come on forward. Shamar Smith, please come forward to introduce us to our new member, Greg. Good afternoon, esteemed members and guests of the Rotary Club. I'm Shamira Smith, the Vice President of the Corporate Work Study Program at DePaul Crystal Ray High School. And it is my privilege to introduce Mr. Greg Wingfield, one of our newest Rotary Club members. Greg holds a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communication with a specialization in public records from Wright State University. With a rich background in business and sales, Greg spent 12 years in corporate finance at GE Capital and Synchrony Financial before assuming roles in student development and business curriculum oversight at a high school in Dayton. Now, as our business sales manager at DePaul Crystal Ray High School, 
Greg will play a vital role in fostering relationships within greater Cincinnati business community, which is absolutely crucial for the success of the corporate work study program. His dedication to empowering Cincinnati's youth and commitment to community sets him apart. Greg cherishes the time he spends with his lovely wife, daughter, and family who all mean the world to him. And although a Dayton native, he is an avid Cincinnati Bengals fan. Please join <laughs> Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Greg Wingfield. All right, Lori Quinlivan, Michael Schatzman, Angie Ferguson, please come forward. There's nothing better than peer pressure to have all three of you up here to make an announcement about some very important projects going on in Cincinnati uh, and your Rotary Club. So um, let's start off with Angie Ferguson. Hello, guess what I'm here to talk to you about? There go, girl! Yay! A um, couple things. So registrations are going awesome. We have about six, I'm sorry, 80 people signed up. We've got, I know, um, and we've got 12 slots left for the actual tournament. There's been a little bit of confusion for newbies coming to Pickleball, what they, what they should sign up for, so I wanted to clarify. So from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock is the tournament itself. From 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock is where it's open bar, open food, and open courts, open play all night long. So if you're a newbie, I would, if I were you, I would buy the all-in ticket, that's for the 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock time frame, and then get a lesson. It's 20 bucks to get a lesson from the house pro at ACES. So take a lesson, that'll happen at the 6 o'clock hour, and then you can stay the rest of the night and play on the open courts and have some fabulous food and have some fabulous drinks. Um, the signature cocktails are amazing. We have cocktails and mocktails. We've got king's cake donuts to round out the night at the end of the night. I want to tell you the menu because if you have any food restrictions, vegetarian, um, anything with gluten, please let Sarah know so we can order. We are ordering food this Saturday so that they can get it in on Sunday. Um, the menu is on the back table there. It's got this here, but it is gumbo, Cajun shrimp, fried crawfish, Cajun chicken pasta, and shrimp po' boys. And then we're going to have King's Cake Donuts at the end of the night. So please let Sarah know if you have any restrictions. Um, get those sign-ups going. I'd love to see everybody there. Thank you. Well, thank you to our pickle queen. A tough act to follow. So... I wasn't originally scheduled to speak today. Uh, Ron Dumas, our Jefferson Award winner from last year, was scheduled. He couldn't be here at the last minute. So past president Bill Shula went to the pen, decided to bring in the right-hander. And here I am to, to kind of help out. So I decided, you know, the Jefferson Award is what I'm here to talk about. A lot of different things I can say about it, but what do you guys actually know? Well, let's find out. It's time for a pop quiz. So I'm going to ask a question about the Jefferson Award. Then I will say, ask you to raise your hand if you know the answer. So, okay, everybody got it? I'll ask a question, and then I'll tell you to raise your hand if you know the answer. Ready? Raise your hand. <clears throat> okay. You got the joke. Okay, question number one. Did you know the Jefferson Award started in 1972 by former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis? Let me finish the question. <laughs> no, 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 offsides. Uh, throw a flag on him, would you? Thank you. He's an, he's an official. So um, anyway, Jackie Kennedy Onassis and Senator Bob Taft. Raise your hand. Okay, not bad, not bad. Question two. Did you know that Rotarian Doug Adams was the first member of Club 17 
to win the local Jefferson Award in 2005? Raise your hand. Okay, you guys are doing pretty well. Question three. Do you know Club 17 is currently, currently accepting applications for the Jefferson Award? Please raise your hand. Good, you guys are doing pretty well. Question four. Do you know the deadline to submit an application is next Thursday, February 15th? Please raise your hand. Okay, now, no pressure, but this is time now for the extra credit question. This is worth 75% of your total score. So we mentioned that the deadline is February 15th. Everybody got that? Okay. Did you know that on February 15th, our speaker will be Hamilton County Prosecutor Melissa Powers? How many of you are bringing a prospective member that day? Oh, you all failed. <laughs> you failed. So I guess the only thing I can do is try to create hope in the world and give you all an extension. So if you haven't signed up to bring somebody next week, you have until 5 p.m. on Friday. Is that correct, President Duck? 5 p.m. on Friday to RSVP. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I have another date that you want to mark on your calendar, which is a great day to bring a guest to Rotary. It's for our high school speech contest, and that's going to be on February 29th. So the last Thursday in February, it's actually Leap Day. So we hope you'll bring somebody that day. The four schools that we have competing this year are Walnut Hills, Wyoming, DePaul Cristo Rey, and McNicholas. And want there, we're doing our in-house, in-school competitions right now. And the winner from each of those four schools will be here that day to give a speech incorporating our four-way test on something they're passionate about. Um, we have celebrity judges coming. This year, our celebrity judges are Vice Mayor Michelle, uh, Michelle Lemon Kearney, um, Channel 5's anchor Megan Mitchell, who just moved back to town from, from Dallas, and a former Olympian, Mary Weinberg, who's also a, a member of Cincinnati School Board. So we have exciting judges, and then while those judges are tallying their scores, we're going to have last year's winner, Lynn Sandman from McNicholas. And she'll be here to talk about the impact of competing in the contest, winning the contest, and then whoever wins this year gets to go on and represent our club at the district contest on March 10th at Wright State University. So I want to thank all the committee members who are helping this year and also let you know we'll meet one more time before the contest on February 22nd, either before or after our lunch meeting. I'm not sure when. But please, bring a guest on February 29th to the speech contest. Thanks. Huck, so am I getting this right that you need a couple of volunteers this afternoon at 3 o'clock to help with the speech contest. So if you have a spare minute or two at 3 o'clock this afternoon, please see Hux Miller. Uh, also, in the in line of announcements, uh, applications with a deadline of February 15th are still being accepted for the World Affairs Western Hemisphere Project. The deadline for submission, again, is February 15th. Forms are available at check-in. They can be turned into Deborah Schultz, Jim Cunningham, or Tom Noonan. All right, um, one final announcement here. A big congratulations to Rotarian Allie Hubbard and her husband, Bo, on the birth of future Rotarian Piper Allison Hubbard on Friday, February 2nd. And of course, also congratulations to Grandpa Rotarian Fred Fisher. Let's give them a big round of applause. And you all probably saw me because he's all about trust. Uh, Pete Blackshaw has chosen the winner for um, saving a few minutes here. The ticket for um, our split the pot is two, three, three, five, three, seven, 
233537. Whoever has that ticket has won $60. Who's the winner? Over here in the corner, awesome. They did not give me the envelope. So uh, Jim Yonker, do you have the envelope? It's in your bag, Christy. All right, uh, do you want to come just do the drawing and get the, over here in the corner. Let's do the drawing first. Now the drawing for the Queen of Hearts and the big pot is $1,496. $1,496. Queen of Hearts. Three of Hearts, so, so close. All right, congratulations. So um, in our community, when people need some wisdom, they turn to our speaker today. Uh, Pete Blackshaw came to Cincinnati in 1997, started the first digital division for Procter & Gamble. The entrepreneurial bug bit him. He went on to create a company that became a multi-million dollar firm, Planet Feedback. Then he joined another consumer products company, Nestle, as their digital and social media director based in Switzerland but the magnetism of Cincinnati brought him back in 2018 to become the third leader of Centrifuge, the organization created by the big companies in Cincinnati to spark our startup sector. Since joining uh, Centrifuge, Pete's created a, a job hub, a startup hub in our community, Union Hall, just a few blocks away. He's put since he startup week on the map nationally, has expanded the venture capital that's available in our community for local startups, and is just an all around great guy. He has been toying with all kinds of things, as you can tell from his background in entrepreneurism, social media, digital, but there's been three themes that have really captured his attention over the last few years. Trust, we've served together on the Better Business Bureau board. Sustainability, as Ariel talked about, um, he lights up when he's talking about uh, the future of, of our world with the things that are going on around sustainability. And then more recently, artificial intelligence. Sadly for our community, he's gonna lead, leave the pulpit at Centrifuge come March 31st. Um, because he's going to pursue yet another big idea at the intersection of those three themes, artificial intelligence, trust, and sustainability. Will you give a warm rotary welcome to our speaker today, Pete Blackshaw. All right, give it up for your president. He gives me way too much credit. He has always been one of the greatest uh, champions of this community, and I'm really, uh, uh, and, that, and actually it was folks like Doug that really got me excited about coming back to this community. Uh, much as I love Switzerland, there's just something about Cincinnati. <laughs> what? Wow, no, I love the skiing, but no, 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 there's a great gravitational pull to this kind of community, and I think there's so much that we can do. I was so happy to hear uh, the commentary about sustainability. It is the big unlock for our region. I've long believed, uh, you know, we've been rated like the number one most sustainable city in the country. And then I've read all these CEO speeches and all the LinkedIn posts, and it's sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. And so how do you take that, that commitment uh, that declaration and combine it with the startup economy and really plant a flag that not only inspires Ohio, but the United States, but the entire, the, the entire world. And I think there's big potential. And so I'm so happy you guys are doing it. Sometimes it's a lonely effort, but it can catch fire. And we know that the issue is not going to get easier anytime soon. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to walk you through, yeah, I, I kind of have like three big themes that I want to get across. I'm going to try to move this over here so I don't feel like the, the podium is blocking me. Um, yeah, I think, you know, number one, we are in an unprecedented moment. And if there's anything I want you to leave with, 
is that it is a disruption unlike anything we've ever experienced before. Um, it's also a moment that's incredibly inclusive and entrepreneurial friendly. And I think sometimes the gobbledygook and the jargon of technology gets in the way of that understanding, but the AI revolution that I'm going to talk about is infinitely accessible. It is an absolute kind of game changer. And, and I wanted to share, just to keep it simple and listicle oriented, like 10, you know, 10 insights, 10 things you can take home. You know, they may relate to you in different ways, but we all need entry points. And I've been um, drinking out of the fire hose over the last year or so in this area. So I wanted to share a little bit. And hopefully in a Q&A, you can stand up and say, Pete, you missed something really important. And we'll be taking notes. Sound good? OK. Um, yeah, so a little bit about, you know, you got, you got the general bio from Doug. I, I, the, the one thing I would add is that um, maybe to a fault, maybe a bit over the top, I, um, I'm a big believer in social media, but for all the good reasons, connecting with people at scale, uh, the power of thank you. I try to say thank you 200 times a week on social media and, um, and nurturing relationships. And some of you have already friended me on LinkedIn. But uh, if there's something that you have a passion to talk about, you know, reach out. I, I'm, I'm really good at connecting and, and let others know because I'm kind of, I want to build a bit of a movement around some of the things that I'm talking about. Uh, Doug mentioned my startup. I thought I would just kind of establish those credentials. Um, and there's a lot of people that are feeling what I felt at Procter & Gamble when I said, oh my gosh, there's like a revolution taking place around consumer power. And so I um, left a job I loved, kind of similar to what I'm doing now in leaving Centrifuge. But you know, there's a moment when you just got to jump in and give it a go. And so I wanted uh, Cincinnati to be the consumer capital of the world with online consumer feedback, and we launched a company that, um, I mean, startups are not easy, so I got a lot of battle scars. We merged with another company, then we rolled up with another, and then we were eventually sold to Nielsen. But the premise still, the, still, the, the, the premise still lasted, which is that we wanted to empower consumers to give feedback to companies, and then we kind of monetized the data. We sold the data back to companies. Um, but we helped them get a better sense of what this mushrooming body of consumer commentary was saying about them. And those are the models that I like. You know, using data to help companies get smarter, to get better connected with their customers, to maybe catch that small nuance that they sometimes miss as they try to work with consumers at scale. And, um, and you'll see a lot of that in the context of social media, in, in terms of uh, AI. Um, at Centrifuge, I mean, we are so committed to helping any of you who want to pursue your dreams as it relates to technology. And that is a wide open space. We do everything we can to provide services, capital, connection, resources, mentorship. We even have space at Union Hall. We have a fantastic team. We're starting to build this amazing fund that is starting to invest money locally. Uh, that was a big, big obsession of mine. Like, how do we take that centrifuge fund and direct some of it more locally? We've got a world-class team fund manager, um, you know, connecting with more startups and helping them get to the next level. So that's a long way of saying there's no excuse for you not to be either thinking about your own startup or telling others, especially if you have kids that are skeptical about whether this community has the chops to lead in technology. And it's important for you to be ambassadors that there are resources. There are companies like P&G and Kroger and many, many others that are willing to pilot. But one of the things that we all need to do is we need to keep the talent here. We also need to recruit the talent back, you know, the boomerangers. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, learn more about what we offer and spread the word. You're all great leaders. but. Uh, we want you to kind of put on your megaphone and say, this can, in fact, be the top tech startup hub um, in the Midwest or broader, but we got to get that message out with conviction and sincerity. 
Um, I, so I wanted to open up with a little game, uh, a little engagement. And one of the things that we're all going to have to learn in the context of AI is the art of the prompt. And we're all typing things into the computer, and it's coming up with responses. And we're kind of scratching our heads and saying, OK, how did it come up with that? You know, it's not like Google search where it just gives you the first listing on the search result. It's kind of this blended response. I remember when, when the first night I started playing around, they said, how does Pete Blackshaw write? And I just couldn't believe what it came up with. Um, but one of the things we need to figure out is like, like the art of the prompt. Like, how do you ask the right prompt? So what I wanted to do is just open up by challenging you. And you can raise your hand. You can blurt it out. Maybe Doug will have another prize. Um, when I show you the image, I want you to guess what the prompt is. And mind you, the, this is graphic art that today you can create in about five seconds. In fact, it used to be ChatGPT. Now Google just launched this last Thursday. But I want you to think about what is the prompt. So here's the first one. What is the question that led to that piece of artwork? Give me a question. This is like Jeopardy. Come on. Close. That might be it. Oh, I know. Well, it is straight. Now, almost all the images have drones. And so, and that's where you have to think, like, what's going on there? Someone, the algorithms are really, really confident about drones. Or maybe they're missing a screw. I don't know. But um, yeah, what's, what's the future of community service in Cincinnati? OK, interesting, huh? OK, let's try another one. <laughs> All right. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK, come on. What is it? Ah, OK. What's the, what is it? What's the prompt? What's the future of Club 17? Pretty close. What's the future of the Rotary, uh, Rotary Club? Um, you can have so much fun with this. It's crazy. Um, all right. You got to get this one. Give me a question. Yeah, what's the future of work? OK. And then you kind of look at it and say, yeah, that kind of makes sense. You know, and it's not so far off, just like in the last, what, a week? You know, how many, how many Twitter things have we seen of folks walking down the street with the, with the glasses? So what you thought was like five years out is actually pretty close. But it does help you. I use these in um, brainstorming all the time just to kind of get people thinking. You know, I'm a big future back thinker. I think it's much easier to think about the, the world five years out. Uh, there's too much noise in the present to see tomorrow, but it's much easier to see five years out as you're trying to think about your roadmaps and the like. OK, what's this one? I love. So what it says, it says carbon footprint. It didn't spell it right, but it meant to say carbon footprint. Yeah, so that one's like, what's the carbon footprint of Pampers? And again, I, that one's interesting because we are entering a world where there's going to be radical transparency into the environmental scorecard of products. When I was at Nestle, this was like a big obsession, like literally kind of following every stage of the, of the product via blockchain and the like. And now this stuff is going to get real. And it's going to have huge consequences for brands. It's going to hold them more accountable. Um, OK. I just joined the brand of uh, the board of a pet supplements company. So I used this in a workshop a couple weeks ago. So what's this one? Close, 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 close. No. I'm kind of disappointed you get this one. It's like right under your nose. This is like, what's the future of the vet? Ah, OK. No dog owners here, I guess. OK. Um, <laughs> all right. This one, if, you, if you've worked at P&G, you better know this. Otherwise, going to kick you out. What's this one? What? Come on, almost. There you go. All right. What's the future of cleaning? And I've done a lot of workshops for P&G on like a where is it going. And again, 
But again, you can go to these, uh, I mean, you, you may have a bar or a barber shop or an office and you could say, imagine an office that combines a laundromat and a bar and allows you to play putt-putt golf. And, and again, it's not like, and this is where these tools kind of, they, they kind of open up creative confidence. I think so often we talk about it's cannibalizing people's time, it's putting the artist out of business, but it's also allowing us to kind of extend the possibilities of what, what we do. And that's the big theme I want you to think about in the context of AI. Um, oh, this is a great one. Okay, if anybody can get this, you get, uh, you know, an extra tutorial from Pete. No, I want you to tell me what I asked it to draw. You're not going to guess it, so I'll tell you what I asked it to. I, I gave the same prompt to Google Bard, which just launched this last Thursday, and I did the same prompt for, so I said, draw a bangle and a red singing karaoke in front of Music Hall. Now, Google's like new, so they, for, they, they, their algorithm hasn't figured out that that's not Union Hall. Um, I thought ChatGPT, which has been around for a while, was pretty good. And it's important to know that, like, don't get hung up on this discussion about hallucinations. And it's, 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 it is true there are mistakes, but we are in an arms race of these top players. It's going to get better and better and better. My guess is that during the elections, we'll have a little bit of a volcano of misinformation, uh, as we always do, but I think that will kind of settle out and these systems are gonna get really smart. Okay. Oh, so so we're, we are in, we are in a moment, if you asked me a year ago, would I be doing this or talking about this, I'd say no, you're probably on drugs. But um, this is a, moment very, very similar to when the Gutenberg Bible, uh, Gutenberg um, printing press came out. It was a massive disruption. At that time, you know, all the knowledge was stored up in the hills with monks, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the printing press kind of allowed the free flow of information, and many have likened uh, the open AI, the generative AI to, um, you know, like electricity, and I think it's spot on. For me, it's a much bigger deal than when, um, than when the, uh, even the web came out. And it's introducing a lot, of, a lot of opportunity, which I'll mostly talk about, but it's also introducing some really, really difficult questions. Um, and one of the additional things that I've done is recently started, uh, a couple of you are involved, um, a responsible AI consortium to really make sure that we get in front of the really difficult trust questions. In fact, I think Cincinnati can actually lead in that area, but I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I mean, these stats are just staggering. I mean, travel search is probably the biggest activity on the internet, and this is just a couple months after ChatGBT came out. You just see the number of searches um, on just that one tool, and now there's like a dozen or so uh, AI search engines. Um, now, I often get asked, like, where do you sit in the spectrum? And I know this slide is hard to follow, but um, I mean, there's like two, there's two parts of the extreme. There's AI utopia, and you know, I'd say some of the folks are a bit naive about, you know, everything's gonna be great, all the way to AI apocalypse, and I'd say you're reading a lot of that in the news. If you ask like where this speaker sits, I'm probably right here. I'm what I call uh, an urgent optimist. I'm not naive about the downside, but I see the possibilities. And I urge all of you to be urgent optimists. It's here, it's not going away. The question is how do we as leaders shape it in the right way? How do we turn it into something good? And I hope some of these ideas I share will get you thinking about that. So here's a few opportunities in the AI space, and I'm sure uh, many of you will relate to this. Um, so the first, the first obvious one is just like a personal power vitamin, and this was really big for me. Um, I talk a lot about AI in the context of my centrifuge journey, but I would say the expertise really came from doing things myself. Um, and my assistant, uh, Taffy, is here, and we're both kind of trading notes all the time about just, oh, how we did this, and I, we, made, we got certain things done faster, or we covered this little widget that 
uh, save time in our personal life. And there is just a lot of efficiency that comes. So think about it as a catalyst for human capability. Um, you know, it autom I can automate mundane tasks. Um, and, and I'll give a couple examples. So I am, um, is anybody using Otter? I, I am like, yeah, I mean, it's, is it a lifesaver? I mean, it's like, I, I, <laughs> I keep upgrading the amount of minutes, but, um, you know, Otter will, um, it's just voice transcription, but it's really good and it'll organize your notes. And I will like, you know, I have this thing at work called down the podium note taking, where the idea is by the time the speaker's down the podium, I've already sent my notes to the team. And I'm just wickedly fast and people are like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? But, you know, I'll use Otter, I'll dump it into ChatGBT, I'll give it a good prompt, like organize this, write a summary note, maybe highlight the tension points, and then boom, it's off. And think about all the great knowledge that we learn, meetings where it wasn't summarized, so you only got a slice of the ROI because our memories are fleeting. So how do you kind of archive and preserve knowledge? That's so incredibly important. Um, I've got another tool that I love called Opus Clip, where you could take, uh, you could take a little 10-minute speech from Doug and then run it through the software, and it will find the parts of the clip that were most poignant, and then it will overlay this TikTok-like commentary, and I think I've got an example. In fact, I typically, I always, in all my leadership training, I always use the expression, trust your inner consumer. Your inner consumer is that compass for great business decisions and leadership. And it's what powers the work-life advantage. Again, so what I did with that was I just, um, someone wanted to show me the tool and they took one of my TED Talks, I've got a couple TED Talks, uploaded it, and the AI just found the gold. And then it overlaid the text. And it was fantastic because I've almost been in this paradigm like this, uh, of like, oh, you gotta watch the whole speech and like 15 minutes is too long and they're almost like translating into TikTok. And, you know, short form consumable and a lot of, I've been spending a lot of time with the younger generation. In fact, I just joined the board of a, a Miami student, student agency that's just on fire called Step Up Social. And they're just like, the TikTok is like, they are so good at using AI, and yet they come across as so incredibly authentic. So again, it's not I'm forfeiting the human to the automation, but in some respects, they're using AI to connect in more meaningful ways. And so, don't, don't get caught up in this polarization. There's a blending that takes place. And this is a good example. I think like the Pete energy comes across really well. Um, the creative confidence builder, there is no limit to the, the creative pa 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 capabilities that can come. In fact, when, um, when ChatGPT first came out, the conventional wisdom in the newspaper was that the, um, all the artists were going to get screwed. In fact, that was a community that probably got lifted the most because they were able to do things that they could have never done before. All of a sudden, you know, folks were like little mini Steven Spielbergs using the artwork. And that's not to say there isn't going to be disruption in that market. That doesn't mean uh, salaries aren't going to go down in some, in some areas, but there's just a much bigger canvas. And again, like how do you take advantage of that? And that's something we've been thinking about in terms of our, um, you know, this community. Um, I'll give you, uh, if you want to check out something, I'll give you a good, I, I've started this t Instagram account called skidoggy.ai, and um, I've got a golden doodle, and I've just been having fun, like, creating content of my incredible golden doodle and with Swiss backgrounds, and I'm just having fun. Like, imagine, um, you know, imagine my Swiss, my, my white golden doodle having fondue with a background. And again, it's just, it's pretty amazing what you can do. Now, I've been doing a lot of coaching with nonprofits. I'm really close to John Pepper, and he's donated a lot to nonprofits. So he's got me doing all these webinars, training, and, you know, they don't have budgets for big marketing departments, but they have an important story to tell. And they have constituents that they need to make connections with, and the ability to kind of use art to tell the story is really big, and so these tools can be enormously helpful to those that don't have a lot of cash. Um, and so, you know, just think about that in the context of like, what's the upside of this? Well, um, 
we can actually help a lot of groups get smarter with this. Um, you know, a treasure trust, this notion is that there's just a lot you can discover um, within the whole AI space. The, um, I mean, I'll kind of give you a, yeah, an example. Let me see if I can take this back for a second. Um, so I've got, how do I frame this? So I've kind of realized as I'm, you know, in my 50s that I probably was never diagnosed as, I probably have a little bit of dyslexia, but I was never diagnosed. But sometimes my thinking can be overly divergent. Um, it's why I'm a big idea. I think most of the, I think most of the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, they say like half of them are dyslexic. So I, um, and one of the things that's interesting is that I've been, I've come up with this term I call dog walk journalism, where I will uh, take my dog on a walk, and I'll take my trusty otter, and I'll just share my thought of the day. And it, you know, sometimes it's disjointed, it's, in, it's based on an insight. It may not even really make sense, and then I will dump the thinking into ChatGBT, and I will say, organize this, connect the dots, find the thread, and I have been doing, I've published more articles this year in ad age than I have, you know, for the last five years. And it's not plagiarism, it's not cheating, it's just a different way of structuring the unstructured. And you think about all the kids who, I mean, I was lucky, I kind of overcame a lot of my insecurities early about my thinking style, you know, but think of all the kids that like lose confidence because they, um, they just can't get over that hump. And there may be opportunities where AI becomes your best friend. It may coach you through that. And that's what we need to think through in terms of how do these tools kind of, um, you know, kind of level the playing field for everyone. And it's going to require a deep think. I think the academic community is going to have to get really serious. They're going to have to check their agendas at the door. They're going to have to get beyond, oh my god, kids are cheating, that's not, that's, 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 that's a blip on the radar, but the way we use these tools is going to change everything, and it could, in my view, if we manage it correctly, make society much better. Um, and this is a point I'm really passionate about, and I'm proud of the fact that Cincinnati is pushing new territory in this area. And some may think I'm naive in saying this, but I actually think that uh, AI could be the great equalizer if we apply it correctly. And so I'm very passionate about equity. You know, I, I came back here in part to this community because I wanted to have a positive impact on uh, what I think is an almost an absurd um, inequity in venture capital and who gets the money and who doesn't. And could we change the math here in Cincinnati? And, you know, we've tried to be, you know, open our door to underrepresented entrepreneurs, but we've also started to think about, well, maybe AI is part of the answer. And so one of the things that we did, and a big credit to my colleague Maurice Coffey from Centrifuge, we had a program called Nitro Boot Camp where we had, I think, like 35 minority small businesses that came in on a Saturday and we gave them tech skilling, and about 60% of it was AI. In fact, it was quite remarkable. At the very end, we built 60 chatbots in about an hour, and the business owners went crazy. And we gave them training in Adobe Canvas and um, Can well, Canva and Adobe that was overlaid with AI. And I mean, for a small, there's no controversy about jobs at the small business level. They don't have jobs, right? I mean, they're just like building up. Um, and so how do you use AI to really, really give business owners, you know, a bigger bite of the apple, a better start at the starting line? Because um, I think, and, and this is almost what's empowered me to jump out too, because I'm not quite as anxious as I was back when I left P&G about, oh my gosh, I'm going to break the bank. I'm actually pretty confident. I'll kind of know whether my business idea is going to work or not without having to raise a boatload of money. And I think the same thing for small business people before they mortgage their home or 
um, you know, they can actually learn a lot through AI as to whether they're on to something or not. And we need to figure out, I would love for Cincinnati to be the community that figures that out first, that really reinvent, you know, reinvents the rules of how entrepreneurs get access to opportunity. And on that one, I would say for startups, I can, you know, I did this uh, post <laughs> the other day called uh, 101 AI prompts to help startups. These tools, and it's mind boggling. I know, I hope I don't sound too much like a geek, but it is like, it is mind boggling how many tools are unfolding before our eyes. But the benefit to businesses are absolutely huge. I mean, I've, I've probably written 100 business concepts since ChatGBT came out. 100 times easier when I was at Procter & Gamble, you know, trying to put it together. And, you know, so from concept to validation to minimally viable product testing to uh, more effective sales, but the whole value chain can be aided by these tools, and I would love for our community, not just Centrifuge, the chamber, everyone, to take these startup steroids on a regular basis. This can just change the math of who participates and also just increase the odds of who's successful. I mean, there's nothing more... Um, I love my job, but the tough thing it, it, the heartbreaking thing, it's, I mean, just most startups fail. And sometimes they fail with real consequence. Divorce, all that stuff. I mean, it's stressful. And, you know, just everything's, my favorite model is like help startups win. Like how do we just give them the tools that increase their odds of success? Um, and I think we're staring at it right now. And we need to this community should be the one that really says, okay, well, how do we take advantage of this to help the, the little guy or to help the underrepresented founder or the business that's kind of on the precipice of winning but needs that extra boost? And it's right there. Um, and all this is on my LinkedIn page if you want to take a look at it. Um, you know, just, it's, it's incredible how... Um, these tools are like, I always say it's like Socrates in your pocket. And what's so unique about these large language models, and I apologize, I usually put a little glossary list, so if I'm using buzzwords, I apologize. But, you know, these, these systems are these language models that just keep getting smart over time. And what's incredible is that it preserves the search string. And so you can create a string related to some topic and go back and it will remember. Sometimes I'll just dump updated recent news stories just to kind of keep the brain fresh, and then I'll have all sorts of, of dialogue, and you can ask questions you might be embarrassed to ask your colleagues. Um, and again, it's just a really good learning tool, and as we start to think about, think about, again, think about, I think of all those moments growing up where you're just embarrassed to like ask the question, and now you've got a capability that's not only answering the question, but answering the question with quite a bit of precision. Um, and then you can come back, and if you, don't, if you don't like the way it answered the question, you could say, okay, can you put it in a Jay-Z rap, um, you know, and I, I do that all the time. I mean, I probably sent 500 birthday raps. I'm from a family of seven kids, so whenever we're putting texts out, you know, you gotta, you gotta get attention to get noticed. And so I've just, every single birthday note, everyone's like, hey, happy birthday, Amy, happy birthday. And I'm like sending a rap, and like, I get the highest level of engagement. Um, sometimes it's a sonnet, whatever it takes. But again, you can translate any form of content and put it in a context that is received. Again, creative confidence. There's no barrier. You don't have to send it to an agency. Um, and then this is a really big one, you know, a canvas for responsible AI. I mean, you know, I'm a, I've always believed that extreme challenge drives the best innovation. Um, you know, even here in Cincinnati, when we had the unrest in 2000, that, that extreme challenge led to some things that probably should have happened before. Uh, attention on OTR, more community investment. Um, and I would say even with AI, all of the um, challenges around misinformation, deep fakes is becoming a big issue. You know, how do we get in front of it? And could we put our 
you know, could we pl plant a flag there? So I, um, for our last AGM, I invited Yale Cosette, who's the, the CIO of Kroger, uh, for a keynote interview. And he talked a lot about responsible AI. And I give a big shout out to Kroger for kind of being one of the first companies to really lean into that issue. I was really proud as a Cincinnatian. And then the next day, we had a little informal huddle on responsible AI. And I think we, we practically packed the room, right? Ashish, you know, we had all four universities. We had some really passionate startup. So we ended up creating this group called the AI Catalyst with responsible AI being one of our areas. And now we're starting to come up with startup ideas. Uh, we're starting to think about skilling. But there is so much work to be done here. But nothing will make us prouder as Cincinnatians being able to say that we put a positive focus on this space. We got ahead of the, the cynicism and the distrust, and we turned it into something really, really powerful. Um, and then clearly a gateway for engagement. I mean, my gosh, all of you could put incredible bots on top of your websites. I actually built one in like five minutes. If you go to PeteBlackshaw.com, um, I met a University of Louisville program <laughs> professor who literally had a piece of software. And you can ask a question about my book, my writing style. You can probably say, tell a joke about Pete Blackshaw. And, but all of these tools can be the interface to your customer. You know, and again, different ways of engaging and inviting. There's probably a cool one that Rotary could do. You know, I don't think, even think you need to go hire a fancy web designer. You could probably just build it you know, easily. A lot, of the, a lot of the tech barriers are disappearing in this environment. A lot of this Sesame Street simple, you're hearing terms like low code, no code. It's here, so there's no excuse. You can translate your passion into these new vehicles. Um, I do think all of us really need to think about how to think and act like a concierge. Um, you know, how do you invite questions? I, mean, I love concierge because they want you to ask questions because they're like, I've got the great restaurant, or um, here's the jogging path, and it makes you more loyal to the hotel. And in a world of AI, it's not like you're going to break the bank by asking them, inviting them to ask questions. It's kind of automated. You can blend it with human if you want, but it's a new, I do think this whole notion of like services marketing, a, a big theme I got to in my book is going to play out in this environment. Um, and then, yeah, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of your, your, your trusted memory bank. Um, and so this kind of leads to what I've been thinking about. Um, you know, when I was, uh, you know, when I was at Nestle, um, I was mentioning earlier, I was managing social media. And Nestle was a pretty complicated company. They had a history of complicated issues with activists, baby milk formula, allegations of slave labor, just really tricky supply chain issues. And that was partly why I got hired. And we had a famous phrase there, like, Google never forgets. Um, Wikipedia never forgets. And one thing that has really impressed upon me in the recent months is that um, these AI engines don't forget any of that. And it's, and it's interesting. Like, if you go to one of the engines and say, is Pampers sustainable? It, it will say PNG's trying, but they're not, and here are the four reasons why. And so you've got this very intense level of uncomfortable transparency, right? I'm not sure if one of you were the Pampers brand manager, you would say that outright. You might put a little spin on it, you might probably be a little bit more assuring. And so, you know, without saying too much, like the area I've been exploring as part of my next chapter is. Yeah, just how do you build a business model around those AI search results, especially in really complicated areas, impact areas, um, sustainability, trust, even diversity? I mean, you could go to AI and say, does Toyota have a diverse board? And they'll figure it out for you. I mean, it's like incredible. And so, and I think all of that's going to have consequences for brands. I think it's going to bring a new era of accountability for brands. And it will probably lead to better outcomes. And so that is kind of what I've been thinking about. And um, I'll pause right there. I'm not sure if we've got time, but I am uh, really grateful. Uh, if you want to reach out and learn more about the AI space, please do. But I'm uh, thank you for your time.
So Pete, um, I have the prize here for the geekiest speaker we've ever had at the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. <laughs> so in, in all seriousness, this is a token of our appreciation. Our great skyline and the four-way test on the back of this coin made by a local uh, coin company. Uh, we're also making a donation in your name to the Rotary International's okay. End Polio Now campaign. Um, thank you. I wish we had time for questions, but we really don't. But uh, I'm sure Pete may be, be willing to stick around and yeah, yeah, yeah. An answer some individual questions. Let's give him another big round of applause. Can we pose for it in front of the, uh, can we stand over here and pose for it? Yes. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We got the... Thanks. Is that okay? That's it. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. Um, meetings today, we have the Board of Directors in the Registrar Room and Women in Rotary Committee here on the main floor. Uh, as Michael Schatzman said so eloquently, please create hope in this world. Make it a great day. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>